good afternoon, everybody, depending on what part of the country you are in. Welcome to the National Infrastructure Bank uh, Coalition Zoom call on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. My name is Julie Olson. I'm a business owner in the Pacific Northwest, and I am the chair of the Alaska Democratic Party Progressive Caucus. Uh, we've been uh, very successful here in Alaska in introducing a resolution supporting the National Infrastructure Bank, and uh, that's a success that we're trying to duplicate around the nation. Uh, however, today, the uh, purpose of our call is to talk about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So this is a, a previous uh, national infrastructure bank, essentially, in our nation's history. And today we have some experts on the call who are going to talk more in depth about the, uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So we have Stephen Finberg, who's an award-winning author of Unprecedented Power, uh, I was going to show you the picture of the book here, but they've taken me off the video. There it is. At uh, any rate, a fantastic book, a, a, a wonderful character study of Jesse Jones, probably one of the, um, the least known persons in American history who should be more uh, uh, recognized because of the work he did in getting our nation out of the Great Depression and uh, successfully gearing up to uh, participate and prevail in World War II. So we have Stephen Fenberg with us today, and um, he'll be speaking here in a few minutes. And then after that, we're going to go with uh, Dr. Stephen Hubbard, who is an expert in World War II uh, economic history and is also a uh, former GIS analyst who wrote his PhD on infrastructure banks, very knowledgeable. I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to him. And then we will have Alfeka Mutardi, a professional economist, macroeconomist, formerly with the International Monetary Fund who has worked with nations around the globe in terms of uh, getting the financing for the infrastructure um, other nations my... need. Do we have Steven Fenberg? I'm here. Okay. Um, good morning or good afternoon. I'm not sure where you are at the moment. Are you in Texas? I am in Texas. All right. Okay. Um, so do you have some remarks for us today on Jesse Jones and uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation? You bet I do. Are you All ready right. for me to start? Yes. Okay. So I am here today to talk about the original New Deal agency that ironically was started by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover. President Hoover had relied on public relations declarations that the economy was sound, the depression was going to end, everything will be fine, uh, but that didn't work. And by 1932, President Hoover embraced the power of good government and established the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to make loans to banks, insurance companies, and railroads, thinking that would restore confidence and get the wheels of the economy to turn again. Unfortunately, it was a little too late and not enough. Uh, even though by the end of his term, he expanded the lending authority of the RFC to almost the entire size of the federal budget. Now, it was only $4 billion back then, but nonetheless, it was an enormous leap for President Hoover to do that, but he saw the value in the infrastructure bank and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and what it could do to save the economy. Of one of its directors, Jesse Jones, is the person I wrote about. I'm his biographer. And he said something very relevant for today as we grapple with the role of government and how much we should use it and how much we should spend to solve our problems. He said that if the RFC had been established a couple of years before in 1931 and 1932, and if it had judiciously loaned five to seven billion dollars, the worst of the Great Depression could have been averted. And that's something worth remembering today as we decide how much do we spend on our infrastructure and build back better. We need to look back at what Jesse Jones said and the impact uh, an aggressive RFC would have had on our nation's economy back then. When Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated, Congress within days passed legislation, the Emergency Banking Act, 
and one of its provisions allowed the RFC to begin buying preferred stock in banks, a strategy that was duplicated in 2008 known as TARP or the Troubled Asset Relief Program. That's what was used to save our banking system in 2008. And it was a duplication of what Jesse Jones and FDR had done in 1933, only they called it the Bank Repair Program. Mm -hmm. It's important to know that Unemployment then was 25%. Gross national product had been sliced in half. Stocks had lost 75% of their value and suicide rates had tripled. So the RFC began buying preferred stock and bank thinking by recapitalizing them, it would give them cash to lend and it would get the frozen wheels of the economy to turn again. Unfortunately, the shell shock bankers sat on the cash. They were afraid. They didn't want to let go of that money because of the horrible economic conditions. And Jesse Jones and FDR continued to say, if you don't start making loans, the RFC will have to become the lender of last resort. And that's what happened. So once Congress gave the RFC the power to, to lend, and Jesse Jones wrote in his book, $50 billion, that Throughout his 13 years of service, Congress never once turned him down for a request. But the RFC, once it was given the power through lending, not spending, and that is really the important distinction today. It was a lending program, not a spending program. Through lending, it helped citizens and business people save their farms, homes, banks, and businesses from bankruptcy. It did just exactly what our infrastructure bill today proposes to do. It built water systems, irrigation systems. It built roads, tunnels, bridges throughout the nation. It brought electricity to rural America through the Rural Electrification Administration when less than 20% of the people living in rural areas had power. And then through the electric and far, excuse me, the electric home and farm authority, it helped them buy appliances so they could plug into the modern age. It was all done on credit. And the amazing thing about it, these monumental programs made money for the federal government because they were done through lending, not spending. They returned a profit to the federal government and its taxpayers. And when I discovered that about Jesse Jones way back in the, the early 90s, when I first started to do some work about him, that's what captivated me about him. I thought, why aren't we looking more at what he did and what the RFC did to uh, revitalize our nation back in the 1930s? And these programs really worked within FDR's first four years in office by 1936, industrial output doubled. Detroit was producing more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929, and unemployment dropped by 8%. And all the while, war is spreading in Europe and the United States is completely unprepared. We rank 17th in the world in terms of our military. So, Roosevelt's hands were tied. He could see what was happening. He knew the United States had to start preparing, but because of neutrality acts that forbid the United States from selling arms to warring nations and because of public opinion, I think 80% of the population was opposed to intervention unless the United States was directly attacked. Roosevelt's hands were tied, but he had Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, his infrastructure bank. So he turned to Jones and the RFC and 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, the RFC began building the massive factories that would manufacture the tanks, trucks, ships, and airplanes that were required to fight and win World War II. And its efforts were comprehensive. It cornered the market in silk and wool for, for parachutes and uniforms. It built schools to train aviators to fly the tens of thousands of airplanes it was producing. And what's so interesting is, is the way this was structured. The federal government through the RFC owned these massive plants. For instance, in aviation, I think it invested 10 times more in aviation alone than that industry had invested in itself throughout its entire history. 
So the government owned the means of production, at least the, the to corporations to operate after the war was over. It sold all of this to the corporations, which expanded the industrial base and the middle class. The RFC never intended to nationalize anything, either during the Great Depression through banks or through industries. Its intention was to save capitalism and save democracy. So it built all these massive plants. It started being able to supply warring the allied forces because this was then after Pearl Harbor. It had ramped up really well. And you know, I can't help but think when we faced the coronavirus pandemic or the impacts of climate change, I look at how we addressed World War II when our military ranked 17th in the world. We became the arsenal of democracy. Just like when I heard President Biden say the other day that he wants to vaccinate the world. It's the same thing. If we can corral these forces, embrace the power of good government, we can do the same things today that we did during the Great Depression and World War II. Um, I think that pretty well wraps up what I want to say about the RFC and what it did and how its strategies can be adapted today. I think the Electric Home Farm Authority is a perfect example of what can be used today, adapted today, just like uh, the REA brought electricity to rural America. We can bring broadband across the nation to everybody, and then we can help people buy the devices they need to plug into the digital age. And we can do it at a profit for the federal government through lending, not spending. This is more a cultural and political issue than it is an economic issue. We must embrace the power of good government and feel patriotic when we do it. And an infrastructure bank like the RFC is a great way to get started. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments, Steve. That was awesome. And I'm sure we'll have questions for you when we get to the question and answer segment of our program uh, here after our next two speakers. So next I would like to go with Dr. Stephen Hubbard. Uh, one of our um, National Infrastructure Bank Coalition members, uh, a very smart guy who wrote his PhD on infrastructure banks, and he's got a presentation for us this morning. Steve? Okay, thank you. Um, next slide. Oh, keep going. So what I'm going to talk to talk about is a little bit is a first what the RFC did just in terms of loans, um, and it's pretty simple. Uh, just in terms of numbers, but then what was the effect and what was the long, what was the effect immediately and then what was the downstream effect? And then I'm going to wind up with where we are today. So um, here, here's just a, a brief slide on basically the, the number and, and the cost. And so before World War II, as you heard, um, Herbert Hoover created the RFC in 1932 and between 32 and, and December to some essentially Pearl Harbor Day, the RFC gave out roughly 12,000 loans worth about $16 billion to help pull the United States out of the depression. And this ranged across basically everything in the United States, uh, schools, water systems, roads, bridges, you name it, it was uh, financed. And then once World War II started, was, as you heard also, the uh, effort to win the production battle of World War II started in it well in advance of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, but during after Pearl Harbor, another 10,000 loans were given out for about $40 billion, with the lion's share of those actually being small, somewhere between uh, 100 and uh, or 20 and about $400,000. But then also after World War II, the process of going from the industrial economy to the military economy or military production was called conversion. And then the process of going backwards was called simply reconversion. So, and, and this was an enormous effort because basically at least 50% of the economy was geared toward making war stuff, which no one wanted after the war was over or it wasn't needed. And so there were over 15,000 loans that went out. And this was from everything from buying from companies buying the equipment that they had or buying new equipment to replace the um, equipment that they were using to buying the plants. And it all depended on the contracts that they had with the military. And then also during the, from, from uh, uh, the birth of the company through the end of the, through its um, eventual uh, di being dissolved in 1957, it gave out over almost 25,000 loans um, 
to disaster relief, to help everything, uh, to keep the wheels of industry turning and to um, uh, recover from disasters. Okay, next slide. So before World War II, what was manufacturing like in the United States? And of course, there's the story of, of um, Henry Ford and the uh, production line, and then actually the um, basically interchangeable parts, but that actually was a developing uh, idea. So initially when Henry Ford was making his autos, the parts were all still pretty much made by hand. And it was actually Bill Newton, Newton, who uh, as much as Jesse Jones and maybe a few other people were responsible for winning World War II, if you were gonna focus down on a single individual, because basically he was the one who started going, uh, first started out of Ford and then moved to GM and was the champion of truly interchangeable parts versus, you know, uh, versus something I had to file on to make it fit, even though it was supposedly the same part. Um, so uh, that kind of automation only existed partially in the auto industry. The other thing that the pre-World War II industry suffered from is when before the electrical motor in the 1890s, everything was run off of steam engines or water wheels, and you'd have an enormous wheel, and then belts would run off of that, and those would be then uh, power would be pulled off from that on, on smaller belts, and you'd have a very large factory all being run from belts that was driven by maybe one or two boilers. And um, as you can imagine, it was a huge industrial hazard because these things raced along at many miles an hour, and if you got caught in one, you could easily be uh, uh, have lose an arm or be killed. And the process of making um, things uh, highly efficiently with electric motors actually took three steps. So the first thing that happened was they took out the um, big boiler and they put it in a large electrical motor and um, still ran it that way. And then they started putting motors where each of the little stations were. And so they now were no longer attach, attacked to the spider web of belts, but every all the stations and where they were distributed throughout the building, because they're still using the same building, were all in the same place. So this only saw very, very small gains in efficiency. And then they, after they learned a little bit from that, they redid the buildings and they started moving things around. But it wasn't really until they got to the third go round of this that industrial production truly began to take off with electrical motors. So pre-World War II, most of the United States was running off of first and second generation um, construction in terms of the use of electricity. And there was some cooperation between industry, but nothing like what you'll see next. Okay, next slide. So after all of those loans that were given out, I'm just gonna look at two cases quickly. So one is building the B-24 Liberator bomber and the other is the engines for the B-29 and the B-32, the B-24 was the big bomber with the twin tail. And of course the B-29 was the super sleek pressurized um, bomber that of course is a uh, famous or infamous for dropping the, the bombs on uh, Tokyo and also many firebombing raids. So in any case, <clears throat> in 1940, an, an average auto coming off the assembly line in uh, uh, Detroit had 3000 parts and weighed about 3000 pounds. So that was a pretty significant advance in terms of cooperation because a lot of those parts came from small companies and most of the time they fit together and there was still some hand fitting that was needed. But then when they uh, tackled the B-24, a plant was built, a single building that was 80 acres. And it was basically, we're gonna do, Ford decided we are going to make this enormous bomber, which is now 10 times the size and weight and uh, um, well over 10, uh, 10 or 100 times the uh, number of parts on an assembly line too. And it, everything was scaled up. And so in this enormous building, 80 acres or about 1500 feet on a side, the things went back and forth on an assembly line. And um, they, uh, Edsel Ford's goal was to produce one bomber every hour with 450,000 parts and people fell off their chairs laughing. But sure enough, by the time the war ended, they actually were producing one bomber every single hour. So imagine the industrial cooperation and integration that was needed so that everything truly fit. So parts were then machined to a 10 thousandths of an inch. Um, Newton had an enormous impact on this. He traveled the country as I think a three-star general, basically visiting uh, plant after plant after plant. And he would walk through, he was sort of like a sage and he would make a few comments to the uh, plant managers after uh, he left and they would implement his uh, changes and production, production would jump.
And then the other one, of course, is the effort to produce the uh, engines for the B-29 and B-32, which ha uh, had 13,000 parts. The drawings were in six box cars. The uh, actual area of the 19 plants was 2.4 square miles, and that actually produced 2.6 engines per hour. And so this was all due to the enormous industrial uh, cooperation. Okay, next slide, please. So the legacy of this then in 1946 was basically through the RFC loans, 50% of the United States industry was completely remade and probably another 25% was highly impacted. And so we essentially came into the war with not quite mass production in a few places. And we came out of the war with uh, the, the, and this enormous industrial capacity that literally made, I think the number is somewhere between 46 and 48% of the, all the goods made in the world in 1946 were made in the United States. And so basically it was transformative and we became a modern industrial nation. And so one of the, the things that were legacies that are not talked about today, but were integral into the post-World War II success, an enormous economic boom and, and GDP growth above 5% was the sharing of patents and the cooperation between thousands of managers and companies. This all persisted throughout their lifetime until they uh, retired because they all knew each other. Screws and fasteners were um, uh, standardized throughout industries. And so beforehand, before World War II, you could get creepy uh, English um, threads and things like that. And you couldn't necessarily depend on a bolt or a nut fitting if it was called the same thing. But after World War II, to make sure that everything was interchangeable and they could produce this stuff in volume, everything was standardized. Um, we developed modern mineral extraction and uh, production and fabrication. Before World War II, steel was uh, made by puddling, which was a very, which was a high art. This was replaced by rolling mills, so it could be produced in volume. We of course had modern machine tools were created, and there was even a jig, for instance, that to make the uh, Sherman tank that basically rotated it so it could be welded continuously. This allowed us to outproduce the Germans by a factor of four to 10 in tank productions. And why even though their tanks were far superior, technically, we just overwhelmed them with numbers. And of course, aerospace and the, the enormous production of aluminum and magnesium um, came out of that and the machine tool, tools to make airplanes and also the engineers. And so all the engineers who designed the, the initial jets, the 707, um, the, uh, the first four engine jet, they all cut their teeth on the B-17s and, and the B-29s. And so everything was engineered to basically go into battle. And that's why our aerospace, basic, our aerospace industry basically outdid everyone else. Petrochemicals, um, saran wrap was created to wrap up tanks and, and steel items so they wouldn't rust when they were being shipped. And elect modern electronics also got its birth um, during the war. And then finally, pharmaceuticals, as, as I mentioned in a previous um, uh, uh, video, uh, there's a great debate over what won, when, what won World War II. The effort to produce penicillin in volume is one of the things because uh, that is cited because World War II was the first war where more people died on the battlefield than died of wounds that they had suffered in battle. But of course, there were no antibiotics. And as I mentioned, uh, and finally, of course, cooperation between industry and government. And so all of this was engineered by the War Production Board, or excuse me, controlled at the top, who would say, get the uh, orders from what the military needed, it would have the RFC fund it, and then the military would, would basically say how it was going to be, uh, what, what the, t the specifications were. And so this enabled uh, the United States to basically outstrip all the nations in the world. In 1960, we had the number one infrastructure and, and industrial economy, second to none. Next slide. So, so what's happened since then is that basically that effort has been crushed by austerity, which basically is the idea, I'm only going to use PAYGO to finance things. And if you told a uh, business, you can't borrow money against future revenue, um, they, you would basically, whoever was running that company would say, well, that's it. I can't keep up with my competitors if you limit me this way. And this is what's been done to the country. 
So there's basically a battle today as people are trying to decide what policies to follow. And it's based, if you will, on what view they're using from the past. And so there's the folks with the Fordist economy from the 1920s, where industrial capacity was small. And if you get, give tax cuts, then ind industry will go out and build more capacity. This will mean more jobs, and then people will have money to, to buy things. So then there's the, the post-50s uh, view of the economy, where basically, if I just practice a little austerity and fiscal discipline, I'll be able to um, uh, grow my way out of where we are right now, and there'll be more than enough tax revenue to pay for what we need. And this is no longer the case, and I'll get to that in a minute. Then, of course, there's the 1990s through the early 2000s, the globalization view, which is basically if I offshore things, then I'll basically um, have the lowest cost of goods, and that'll free up people to spend their money on something else. But what it also does is it, it destroys jobs. The Bush tax cuts destroyed somewhere between four and six and a half million jobs, led to the rise of the uh, opioid epidemic, which now kills above 80,000 people a year. And um, there's, as a result, there's insufficient tax revenue for us to rebuild our infrastructure. And so finally today, we have what I call as the high automation economy, which is basically things are produced where the labor cost, the total labor cost is the least. And so if I can make something offshore and ship it to the United States, that's what's happened. If I can create an automated factory in the United States with the fewest people possible, that's what happens. And what's going going to happen going forward is there is going to be an ever decreasing amount of labor per dollar of revenue or GDP produced. And so what this means is, is going forward, we are not going to have enough tax revenue to maintain our three major infrastructure bran uh, branches, which I call basically indus industrial, societal, and military infrastructures. And so this is the problem that we face. And this is why we need uh, the RFC again, is because you're not going to be able to do it off of tax revenue. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that presentation. Um, I thought that was uh, wonderful. And we'll be looking for some questions for you in the question and answer period. And now I'd like to go to Altheka Mutardi, our macroeconomist with the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Altheka? Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to all of you today. Um, so we have had a wonderful discussion uh, about the RFC, uh, what it did, how it mobilized, uh, how it completely restructured the American economy, uh, built us uh, as the number one nation in the world for the 21st century. And the, the question now is, what, can, what, is, what do we have today that uh, uh, takes over where the RFC left off? And the answer to that question is we now have a bill in Congress, H.R. 3339, which will create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And this bank is absolutely modeled on the RFC. It will take many of the management uh, types of uh, techniques that the bank, uh, that the RFC used to mobilize and decide what was going to be invested in. It, uh, it also provides adequate financing from the start to have a big picture view of what we need to invest in in our economy to get it back on track again. Uh, and uh, the, the, the correlation between these two institutions couldn't be stronger. So I'm gonna start, uh, if you can go to the next slide, by saying what uh, the National Infrastructure Bank would cover in terms of projects. And this is uh, done by taking a kind of an eagle eye view from, from, from above of where our infrastructure is in the United States and what critical things we really need to uh, invest in irrespective of what we think we have in money uh, from budgets, and that's, that's not anywhere near enough uh, in order to get this whole job done. So what the bank is sized at currently is $5 trillion in projects. And where did the estimation come from? From the American Society of Civil Engineers who say in 16 categories, that's what we need over the next 10 years to repair our systems, to bring them up to snuff. Uh, re that is repairing transportation systems, water systems, upgrading the electric power grid, but we need more uh, to get us into the 21st century. We need a complete high-speed rail network all across the country to move folks faster, um, uh, end our traffic congestion problems. 
We need to make sure that we um, um, get broadband everywhere into every uh, location in the country. We need much more affordable housing. This is critical. Um, people are being priced out of housing with COVID uh, uh, on an emergency basis. Many people uh, will be exposed to uh, losing their, their the places where they live and be put out on the street. Homelessness is increasing and uh, local authorities are not building affordable housing units to the same way they were in the past and large scale water projects. We have a huge drought problem where we grow 50% of the nation's food. And if we don't take care of that, our inflation is going to be even higher. So if you could go to the next slide. So let's say we're, let's look at where we are today. We have just passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And that act was made smaller and smaller and smaller over time as the bill was being negotiated because um, Republicans and Democrats couldn't agree essentially on a way to pay for it through the budget. They didn't really wanna raise taxes and, uh, uh, and things like that. So that's why this bill will now be only providing $550 billion of new money over the next five years. And it'll have to be negotiated all over again. Uh, and there might be a change in Congress in between now and then. So you can see that compared to what the National Infrastructure Bank would provide expressed in five trillion expressed in billions of dollars, the IIJA is one tenth too small. It won't provide everything that we need for roads and bridges, mass transit, drinking water systems. Uh, there's nothing in there at all for affordable housing or high-speed rail. We're glad that the country, that the Congress has passed it and the president has signed it. We always want state and local governments to get grant money first, uh, but we absolutely need um, an institution that will help to mobilize and uh, provide adequate financing for all of our present infrastructure needs, and then be fast on its feet, like the RFC was in changing direction of if something else happens uh, where we could use uh, this bank to uh, mobilize and finance infrastructure. So if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to say something about how the NIB, the National Infrastructure Bank, will mobilize efficiently, just like the Reconstruction of Finance Corporation did in the past. For one thing, the NIB, just like the RFC, will have huge uh, engineering uh, divisions, uh, divisions of lawyers, divisions to check on the loans, loan officers, make sure that um, all projects are proceeding uh, as they were designed without any fraud involved or anything like that, and provide technical expertise because we've kind of lost our way in our ability today to build infrastructure uh, complicated projects. And uh, they're not being well managed either by public authorities or even by private ones like construction companies and that kind of thing. So we need to have a more central repository of engineering expertise for um, um, for investing and designing projects and investing in infrastructure and then providing uh, tech technical help uh, uh, on those projects. And so the one of the ways that the uh, National Infrastructure Bank proposes to do this is to try and encourage uh, regional economic planning accelerator groups. This would be groups of governors or states or localities uh, that could that could get together and uh, formulate projects. Um, that will increase and enhance economic development and, and growth. Uh, and also the RFC, the uh, NIB, just like the RFC, can help to coordinate and solve bottleneck problems. Right now we have huge bottlenecks that should have been in the domain of the private sector. Uh, these are the supply chain problems uh, coming from ports uh, uh, along the Pacific coast that import a lot of our goods today and are not able to deliver them. The truck drivers are quitting all over the place and and uh, 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 containers are backing up in rail car yards, um, that kind of thing. And this bank that can really help to accelerate projects to free up those um, supply chain gaps. That's one example. Another example, uh, as uh, Stephen Fenberg said, is uh, in the area of um, providing vaccines around the world. We can help uh, also with those, um, with, with you know building new hospitals, getting broadband into areas for, um, uh, for telehealth and that kind of thing. But let me give you two specific concrete examples here. One is the National Infrastructure Bank has in it $1.1 trillion earmarked for a complete high-speed rail network all across the country. So how can that help? Uh, this is a, a map here of where the lines might go, the high-speed rail lines might go. 
uh, was designed by a um, transportation engineer who built some of the um, uh, train stations in London, like the King's Cross station, and uh, does it based on uh, economic viability uh, of uh, high speed rail uh, potential projects. And what you can see is that these proposed lines go along lot lines of economic uh, development and growth and corridors of economic development. For example, the Northeast corridor has a whole lot of traffic on it and traffic congestion. Trains move very, very slowly. Um, we, uh, this, this corridor produces 20% of the nation's GDP. And by getting uh, things moving faster along that corridor, we can in increase the efficiency of the economy. Uh, we can get people to work faster save hugely on fuel and CO2 emissions uh, and just uh, and, and unplug areas where, for example, trucking, which carries not some 65% of the nation's uh, goods, uh, can, can move faster and, and get to their destination quicker. So this will grow, uh, high-speed rail will grow along these economic quarters, grow the economy. That's what happened in China, where over the last 15 years, they have now um, used a, a, a bank like our National Infrastructure Bank proposal to finance their, um, their high-speed rail construction. And uh, they've done it to promote their economy along their Belt and Road Initiative uh, and really grow their economy. They have beautiful uh, 21st century train stations and high-speed rail lines uh, that move their workers back and forth to work um, and um, make their economy much more efficiently. And you could even see satellite images of how the economy has responded uh, and uh, over time. We'll have less traffic congestion. Uh, this will grow businesses along these economic corridors. And as I said, save on fuel and CO2 emissions. A second example is uh, we need much more investment in our water systems. Uh, that's two kinds of infrastructure. One is drinking water, wastewater, storm water, and repairing lead service lines. We have a dedicated $8 billion in our bank just for that. Uh, if we don't, and, and, and this is a matter of safety, and uh, uh, there's just no reason why in the 21st century, we have these buried lead service lines and it's kind of, uh, uh, people are not paying adequate attention to them. They haven't uh, even um, inventoried where they are or added up, and, and in many cases, the, the total uh, cost for replacing them. But there are some, some uh, studies have been done, like the city of Chicago will need 10 to 12 billion all by itself. Uh, we have problems all over the Northeast and, the, and Midwest where these lead service lines are in place. And we need to get them as a matter of safety out of the ground uh, quickly as a first uh, um, um, as a first priority. Uh, whereas the Environmental Protection Agency has said, well, we don't have money to fund this. And so we give you 50 years to be able to replace these lines. That's just simply not adequate. Uh, as we need to fix them right away. The $15 billion that's in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act for lead service lines is not anywhere near enough. And the bank will provide all of that money uh, to replace those lines. Um, the the uh, uh thanks thank you alfeca maybe okay. you could give us a summary uh line and then we're, i want to move on to our questions and answers great thank you very much and i just wanted to say that the uh a lot of the um the, the way that the RFC was uh, managed and uh, the way that it operated, the way that it mobilized uh, is a great model for the National Infrastructure Bank. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, so uh, we are now moving on to questions and answers. So please feel free if you have any questions to put them in the chat or uh, raise your hand and we will try to get to everyone. Uh, for starters, I would like to throw out a question to our panel. And that is we've heard a lot of discussion here about the, how the RFC remade the US economy. So today we are in a global supply chain crisis. Everybody's talking about it, right? And there's a lot, a lot of conversation in the business community about uh, diversifying their manufacturing so that uh, our business community can get away from being dependent on manufacturing essentially in Asia. Now the RFC uh, invested in manufacturing capacity and was credited with uh, creating new industries. For example, the synthetic rubber industry, essentially, as I understand it, was created by and financed by the RFC. So for our panelists, do you see a place for the National Infrastructure Bank to invest in uh, industrial capacity uh, and, and bringing the manufacturing in those industries back to uh, the US? I know 
I read just recently, I was sort of dismayed to see that um, uh, Samsung, a, an overseas um, company, is looking at in, uh, spending millions to put a new chip plant in Texas. But in my opinion, we should have that capacity for American US-based companies. So would any panelists like to address that? I, mean, I, can, I, can, I, I, I can say something about what the RFC did and how it could be duplicated today. Okay. When, when private banks are unable or unwilling to make those kinds of investments, then the infrastructure bank can step in because oftentimes the investments are risky or they're massive and they're too big for private banks to handle. In those instances, a new infrastructure bank can step in and take the lead in making investments, making loans. That's the, that's the key. These are loans to build the manufacturing capacity to ensure the United States is secure. That goes with, with rare earth materials, figuring out how to, to uh, collect them from around the world so we have an adequate supply. Anything that is, is essential, the RFC or a new infrastructure bank can make those loans to build the plants to make sure that they are available for the United States and for people around the world. And I would, I would add into that that the language that uh, Stephen just described is actually in the bill. Any place that there is a strategic need for a public good that is not being met by the private sector, the bank can step, st uh, step in and make loans. And that also extends to improving uh, cybersecurity for our electric grid, for example, where many of the transformers are made overseas by our uh, uh, competitors who were not, were not really sure about the chips and the technology that are in those transformers. Uh, so they all have to be rechecked uh, for, for security reasons. And when we build a plant over here to build the, uh, the, the components for those kinds of transformers, uh, we need to have them built in America by American companies to make sure that they're cyber secure. All right, thank, thank you. And I, I would like to add one more thing to that. The RFC always gave private businesses first choice. It said, this is what we need. And if they were unable or, un or unwilling to respond, that's when the RFC would step in. Did the RFC guarantee loans made by private commercial banks? Steve Fenberg? I'm not sure. That's that's a good, you know, I believe that it did in some instances. I know that it helped many industries refinance their debt. For instance, the railroads, which were at the time the largest or one of the largest employers and taxpayers, they were bankrupt. So the RFC stepped in and helped them renegotiate or refinance their debt so that they could survive. It also helped them finance the development of high speed rail, much like we're talking about today. Everything we're talking about today, the RFC did it in the 1930s and the 1940s. And oftentimes it did so at a profit. The okay, thank loans, you, thank you. loans from the RFC were basically self-insured and that if the company defaulted, the RFC would usually eat the costs, although Jesse Jones was very careful. And in some cases it took 10 or 15 years to recover the cost of the loan, but he still did it. But there is something that they did that helped begin, uh, helped unfreeze the uh, frozen uh, financial system, which is that they began to make small loans um, to improve real estate and to get banks loaning again. And this actually became eventually Fannie Mae. And those loans were guaranteed by an insurance pool. And this was an innovation that Jesse Jones created so that when, if one um, bank suffered a loss, it was covered by everyone. And so as a result, this helped unfreeze the bank and gave them the assurances that they could start lending again. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. I would like to point out that the RFC ultimately returned a profit to the US Treasury and did not cost the US taxpayers a cent. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of questions. I wanna move on quickly to some questions in the chat. And I'd like to get some, I think these are short answers from our panelists. First question, how would the NIB be governed? That is, what does the legislation say about the qualifications of the members of the board and how are they chosen? That's an extremely important question. Alfeca, can you give us a brief answer on that? Yes, thank you. Um, the uh, board, the NIB would have a board of 25 directors. 
uh, the legislation calls for the directors to be not financial types, but rather engineers, representatives from state and local governance, representatives from minority groups and from labor to make sure that all of the aspects that are contained in the bill get implemented uh, in the way that's envisioned. The projects would be vetted by uh, equi uh, the equivalent of a loan officer who's also an engineer uh, to make sure that the projects are viable. Uh, it will have a large fraud unit, the same as the RFC did to make sure that all the, the projects stay on track and are well designed and we'll have maximum public input be, through these regional planning accelerator planning groups that will uh, design projects, uh, you know, to help get traffic moving faster to make sure that water is safe uh, and, uh, you know, build our infrastructure up in a, uh, a very well planned way. Okay, th thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Art Leopold, who pays back the loans that the NIB makes to cities, governments, etc, and who funds the repayment? Uh, well, let's just reinforce with everybody, this is a bank, these are loans, so whoever applies for the loan has to have a payment stream or a justification for that loan to be able to repay it. And uh, the point here is that governmental entities, whether it's a city or a county or a school district, they're doing financing most every year anyway, but what the uh, National Infrastructure Bank would provide are lower terms, easier, um, um, an easier process, lower fees, and a longer term potentially. So that um, the entities who are applying for loans would be able to uh, reduce the cost, uh, the payment stream required to fund that particular project and or get uh, double essentially the infrastructure for the same amount of money. So whoever applies for the loan, that entity would have to uh, have a payment stream available to repay the loan. I would like to, um, to add sure. that um, basically the failure rate of the loans would be similar to you can anticipate to municipal bonds, which is three tenths of a percent. So it's actually very low and it's very unusual for a uh, city or an agency to default on their loans. Thank you. So, and here's a, another question from the chat. This is a good one. Alfeca, has your info and that of the other speakers been presented directly to every member of Congress, both bodies, as well as directly to the president? So we certainly would like to be able to say yes to that. Um, not yet is the answer, although we're working on that on a daily basis to raise the visibility and awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank with um, governmental entities, representatives, senators across the country. So, uh, and, and we could certainly use your help in, um, in elevating this uh, with your member of Congress. And um, at the end of the session, we'll give you some information on follow-up. So thank you for that question. Now I'd like to go to some of the hands that are raised. So I think David Newman uh, had his hand up. David, do you have a question for our panelists? And you're muted. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, uh, I think that the the, the idea of a, a national infrastructure bank makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't know why we haven't had one all along, uh, why it went out of existence in the first place, and the other supporting structures, the uh, insuring uh, capacity. Uh, we certainly in the rebuilding that is needed, and much of it has just been described here is very important, but there is one area that hasn't been mentioned, and that's the environment. Uh, I've heard no mention of the need to deal with some of the things that Build Back Better bill that hasn't passed the Senate yet uh, is, uh, is absolutely essential for uh, in dealing with the uh, issue of climate. And that's the other aspects of the transportation system, electrifying them. And something that's missing from all legislation so far is a mandate to start uh, ramping down and phasing out fossil fuel uh, extraction and mining. There really needs to be no new uh, uh, infrastructure for uh, fossil fuels. We have to be able to manage with what we've got so far simply as a to cut tide us over until we can build, rebuild the electrical network and, and get the uh, infrastructure in place to support a completely electric system. 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you for those you um, back to your plans to get halfway there by 2030. Uh, and, and, but uh, it's underfunded uh, uh, thanks to a lot of cuts that have been made. But hopefully that can be resolved in future Congresses. Uh, Thank you, David, for your comments. We've had a lot of discussion about um, how the National Infrastructure Bank might be able to positively impact climate change. One, I think the most important things is that is local control over the project. So for communities that are very concerned and aware about the impacts of climate change, they would be able to pursue uh, financing to work on those projects independent of, of national politics. So I think that's really a benefit. But let's quickly move on I, to some can other- I, Can I add something to that? Because there, there's a sure. great strategy through the RFC. Again, I go back to the Electric Home and Farm Authority. It is a great strategy to help people retrofit their homes so they're energy efficient, storm efficient, and wired for the digital age. Take a look at the EHFA for a great model for today. Thank you for, for bringing that up. I'll have to look into that. Okay, um, next I would like to go to Bruce Annis. Bruce, you're muted, but do you have a question for our panelists? Oh, thank you, um, Senator Annis from Delaware. Uh, two of the uh, main selling points, in my opinion, after we've seen his presentation for Third Dawn, uh, really only one had been mentioned. I think the new participants ought to be aware of them. Number one, as you indicated, um, uh, the, the bank, the National Infrastructure Bank itself, uh, creates no new tax and no new debt, with exception of actually starting up the bank itself. So that's a great selling point. The second one is the way that this bank will be capitalized. You may, someone may want to mention that to the new members. I think those are great selling points. Uh, in our state, we have a lot of labor, a lot of labor concerns, and it's my understanding, even though it hadn't been mentioned today, it had been previously, that uh, these projects that are funded have to follow Davis-Bacon prevailing wage. That's an important issue for our state. We have in many states, I'm sure, represented here today, uh, have a, a lot of labor and they're concerned about prevailing wages. So I don't know if you want to make a quick comment on those issues or not, but there are two main selling points, in my opinion. Thank you for those uh, comments. I think um, you made some important points that maybe we didn't, our speakers didn't touch on today. And I don't know, we, we actually paid, our group paid for advertising in uh, one of the Delaware newspapers. I hope you saw it. So um, of course we're trying to get to the president uh, with that advertising. Anyway, okay, we're gonna move on quickly to uh, one of our next people, um, uh, Jean Brenner. You've had your hand up for quite some time. Jean, you're muted. Do you have a question for us? Yes, I have a uh, question for Stephen. Um, Stephen, I read your book uh, quite a while back now, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, what kept coming to me was, and you said quite early on that this was uh, a profit-making enterprise. It ended in the black. And that surprised me. Um, I understand that manufacturers, uh, uh, giving loans to manufacturers, there was lo lots of that. Manufacturers are, are profit uh, uh, organizations. They can pay back their loans. <clears throat> but what about um, highways, rebuilding a highway? Um, unless you put tolls there, how does that throw off profits to pay back the loan? Same with bridges. Um, what about that? And some other, uh, if not every piece of infrastructure is profit producing. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can answer that. First, I want to clarify something. The Great Depression era programs were profitable. The World War II prof, uh, were not. The militarization of industry and manufacturing, all that uh, material, that did not make a profit for the federal government. And it was never anybody's intention that it should even break even. It was a, a national emergency. So the profit was taken out of the equation. The I'll add the, as far as bridges and tunnels and things like that, they Jesse Jones called them self-liquidating loans, and they were paid for by tolls. 
or they were paid for by the municipality that built them. And I think that's one of the beauties of the RFC is that those entities who received the service are the ones who paid for them. But oftentimes, the, like the big bridges and the tunnels, those things, those were paid for, repaid with tolls. So yeah. if you used it, you paid for it. Thank you. Rebecca and Dr. Yeah. Hubbard, is that what you understand as well? Yeah, let me add just one more thing about this flexible repayment terms and, and what, what produces a user fee and what doesn't. M much public infrastructure doesn't produce a user fee, but, but creates a huge public good that makes the economy more efficient and makes it grow. Let's just take uh, local roads and bridges and a, as an example, uh, where they're deteriorating. Uh, some farmers are having to drive miles and miles out of the way, or, or even shipping agencies like UPS and Amazon are driving miles out of the way because a bridge has gone down or been closed. That ed adds to their expenses. And when you reverse that, and uh, build uh, these better bridges, uh, even if they're not told, then, then business is able to produce more GDP with fewer costs for inputs. And that results in greater profitability of their businesses and ultimately in GDP growth, and then ultimately in new tax receipts coming back into, this, into the coffers of state and local governments who have taken these loans for uh, non for uh, for projects that might not be uh, d giving a, an explicit user fee, but now because they've got more uh, revenues coming in, they can repay back these loans out of their general revenues. And I do want to qualify something else I said about militarizing industry. Oftentimes, oftentimes, oftentimes when the plants were sold, they did return a profit to the federal government, most specifically the synthetic rubber plants. Thank you, Steve. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move right on to another questioner. Um, we have on the line former New York City Assembly person, Felix Ortiz. Uh, Mr. Ortiz, do you have a question for us? And you're muted. Yeah, thank you very much. This has been a very, uh, a very, very uh, important conversation. I uh, just took a uh, very quick to Jean's uh, uh, answer, uh, uh, answer. I would say that uh, Major Bloomberg, uh, when I was elected, he developed the, what they call the conjecture pricing, which is taking place as we speak. Now it's begin, begin to get executed in order to pay for roads and bill and highways. Uh, number two, I do have a quick question. And my question is, do we know how many states has uh, so-called infrastructure banking uh, unit uh, in place as we speak? Yeah, and, uh, and if we know, uh, so that will be an avenue that we can probably talk to some of those folks uh, to encourage them to uh, push uh, their government and uh, also the federal government and the local government. And if not, then we should pursue a state legislators, uh, local government, county legislator to introduce legislation to call for an infrastructure unit or banking type so in their respective uh, 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 state. And uh, that, is, uh, that is my point. Thank you. Um, okay, I'd like to um, point out um, in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, uh, my area of the country, uh, the, uh, when they put in high speed rail from Seattle down south to uh, south of Seattle and then going up north, at every stop along that rail line, private development comes in, building new apartment buildings, new commercial buildings, revitalizing neighborhoods. And as those neighborhoods are revitalized, uh, tax revenues go up. And so that is a payment stream that municipalities would be able to consider when they're trying to figure out how they're going to afford, be able to afford to pay for light rail or new roads or fixing a bridge and that sort of thing. Um, next, I'd like to go to a question we have online, and that is, or in the chat, what more can you tell us about the way China has financed their astonishing rise? Did they study the RFC? I heard they have multiple specialized infrastructure banks, one for trains, another for water. Uh, Alfeca, do you know anything about the Chinese infrastructure bank and, and how, how they worked? So the Chinese banks are a little different than uh, maybe some of the others in um, democracy type countries like uh, Japan or Europe. Um, in that they're they're owned by the government, true, but they're uh, they they also have a big central planning component to them, and they might 
order projects or finance projects that don't get viable, economically viable for some time. But they, they, there's just absolutely no doubt that they followed the model of a national bank to finance infrastructure projects. They went from a country in the 1970s that had huge few food insecurity to one in the last 15 years that has built this 22,000 miles of high-speed rail and fundamentally changed their uh, economy with this high-speed rail project and these development projects financed by an infrastructure bank. So there's just simply no doubt that they followed the model uh, and that it's been hugely successful in building the Chinese, their, their, um, their growth rate is around 6% a year. They've, they have used these banks to finance about uh, 8% of GDP in projects all across the country. Thank you, Alfeca. Um, okay, do we have any other uh, hand uh, hands raised from the audience? Uh, otherwise, I'd like to go back to a, a comment here in the chat from uh, David Newman, where um, he's saying deregulation of global trade and financing has been an unmitigated disaster, a byproduct of Milton Friedman's economics adopted by Reagan. David, I'd, I'd like you to know that, David, the University of Chicago, where uh, that was the home of Milton Friedman, I was was in the bookstore there recently and they had a big display on reforming capitalism and in chatting with one of the the uh, people at the business school there they told me like oh yeah that's what they're teaching these days is that we need to reform uh re reform reformat the rules around capitalism because the the old rules are not working and have resulted in this um transition of wealth to the top uh one tenth of one percent in our country so anyway i thought that was interesting um, okay, so can we have some uh, closing remarks, maybe from our panelists, uh, Stephen Fenberg? Uh, can you tell us where we can see uh, your the movie you worked on, Brother? Can you spare a billion? Is that available on Netflix or uh, it's a it's available YouTube? on YouTube uh, certainly, and I also have a website, stephenfenberg.com. And the movie is available there and information about my book, uh, Unprecedented Power. Uh, in my closing remarks, I want to address a question one of our listeners asked about. If she asked, can this entity be above the partisan nature of our government today? Earlier, we were not as polarized. And as I said earlier in my remarks, this is more of a cultural and political issue than it is an economic issue. We must embrace the power of good government and see it as something patriotic. Government is not the enemy. Or as Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it cannot happen if we allow ourselves to think that our government is our enemy. The RFC made loans to every congressional district in the United States of America. It was embraced by Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, because they could see that it benefited everyone in the United States. And I think that's what we need to do again today as we imagine a new national infrastructure bank, let's embrace it as something patriotic and something good that government can do. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate your participation. Okay, uh, Dr. Hubbard, do you have a closing remark for us? Sure. Um, I think there's a battle, there are a couple of battles that are going on right now. And the one that's most apparent to us here in the United States is the battle for control of Congress. And that's being fought as basically as whether government is helpful or as Stephen just said, is the enemy. And if you take the approach that whatever is going on, I'm going to make government the problem or make it fail, we're going to wind up losing the other battle which is basically for control of the planet. And so China, as an example, has the social credit score, which basically is designed to enable those people who are compliant and follow the Chinese leadership, specifically uh, Ping, um, to the letter, can go anywhere and do anything. And those who can't can barely take a single step. And they are working hard at exporting this approach to uh, other nations around the planet. And so while the struggle to who controls the Congress is going on, the real important one is who is going to control the future of, of the entire planet. And this is the one that we're losing. And if we basically keep trying to use austerity, 
And this is basically 1920s economics. In a modern world, we will wind up at the back of the pack. And this goes from losing out on uh, artificial intelligence experts to other countries to basically having more potholes than uh, miles of high speed rail. And we simply cannot become the efficient dynamo that we were in the 1960s by uh, pinching pennies and preventing industry and government working together to rebuild the country. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. And then finally, we'll go to Alfeca, and then we're going to run a, a few slides uh, that show some of the endorsements and some of the advertising the National um, Infrastructure Bank Coalition has been uh, working on. Um, Alfeca, uh, closing remark. Thank you very much. Um, the idea of a 21st century National Infrastructure Bank is not a new idea. We've had four major banks in our nation's past. We absolutely must have a permitted institution in place to be able to finance long-term infrastructure projects, make sure that there's a steady stream of financing over the long term because these projects take years to, uh, to, to roll out. Uh, and so as a result, our uh, the the uh, the legislation in Congress HR three 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 nine does not have a sunset clause in it. Uh, as was the case in the earlier banks, because every time we come up against a sunset clause and the, the bank expires, then we're back into the same difficulty. We simply cannot finance infrastructure through the federal budget or through state and local budgets. And we must have this institution to be able to well manage our infrastructure investments, make sure that they're adequate and make sure that we have a permanent long-term uh, stream of financing and expertise. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, and thanks to, thanks to our panelists and thanks to everyone on the call. Uh, what I'd like to do is go to our next slides. Uh, our group has been working very diligently to spread the message across the country. So we have paid for advertising in local newspapers um, around the country. Here's an example from the Buffalo News. Uh, next slide. Uh, Florida, we paid for, um, oh, I can't remember how much, a, a couple weeks or a month worth of advertising in the news service of Florida. This goes to opinion leaders and um, officials in Florida. Uh, we've had a lot of success there in raising awareness and visibility of the National Infrastructure Bank. And in fact, one of the national um, associations of city and county planners has recently endorsed the National Infrastructure Bank. Next slide. Uh, some an, another examples of where we've put um, paid ads into the newspaper. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, we have been working hard and uh, all of the donations that you all have made to our organization are going to, uh, to actual um, advertising and you know ways that we can spread the word. Um, some of the organizations here that have endorsed the National Infrastructure Bank, groups from around the country. Um, so we've been very, very successful in uh, raising awareness on this issue. Uh, we'd ask you to please call your member of Congress, ask them to sponsor HR 3339 for the National Infrastructure Bank. And, um, and here we have our organization's information, our website, our Facebook page, our phone number. So please give us a call if you'd like some more information or if you'd like to help. Um, we're asking people to try to get uh, op-eds into your local newspapers. We're happy to work with you on that. And we'd love to work with you to get an appointment with your local congressperson uh, so that we can provide them with a presentation on this very important piece of legislation. So thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate your attention. And please remember our next webinar is December 16th. And you can get all the details of that on our website. Thanks, everyone.